good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I like it. Welcome to Berries Grove this beautiful Sunday morning. I hope you are ready to stand up and sing some praises to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's start off with the song, My Jesus. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? God changed that all is stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way. on the Jesus theme this morning with Jesus Messiah.
Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you all here today. We want to welcome you to Berries Grove Baptist Church. We want to especially welcome our guests. We're glad that you're here and uh, hope that you will uh, give back to us that little card that uh, asks for some information from you. Hope you'll get to find out some things about us from the booklet that you've been given. But we're glad that you're here to worship the Lord with us this morning. Jesus Messiah, what a great song to get started with. It just encapsulates why we're here today because all of our hope is in him. Amen? Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have hope because Jesus is the Messiah, that he is Lord of all, that, Lord, we know that regardless of how bleak things might seem while we're here, Lord, we know that our hope is safe with you. And Lord, we look forward to that great and glorious day when Jesus returns. Lord, that is our hope that sustains us, that keeps us moving along in this world. But Lord, we gather together because we also know that we need strength for today. That Lord, we are weak and insufficient creatures. That Lord, we need the ministry of your Holy Spirit. We need the encouragement of your people if we are going to keep going down this road and running the race that you have set before us with endurance. So, Lord, we pray that today would be a day of encouragement through your word, through song, and through the fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we pray that you would be glorified in this service today and that we might be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. We're uh, Finishing up our journey through the book of Matthew today, of course, we skipped ahead to the end for Easter, and now we're going back and finishing the last few chapters before that. We're wrapping up in Matthew 25 today as we look at uh, Jesus talking about the final judgment and the separation of the sheep and the goats. And of course, what we looked at last week at the beginning part of chapter 25, also uh, referring to what's going to take place at the final judgment. Uh, let's see if you can remember our memory verse uh, from Matthew 25, verse 29. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But to the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Yeah, that's a interesting verse when you really think about it. That uh, God is truly going to bless his people in ways that we cannot even imagine and give us an abundance, an overflow of his grace and mercy. But to those uh, who do not know him, even what little bit of the blessings they have enjoyed from him in this world will be taken away one day. And so we're going to see a little bit of that in our passage today. Eric is going to come and he's going to read Isaiah 58 for Old Testament reading. All right, as Craig said, we'll be in Isaiah chapter 58 today for our Old Testament reading. If you'd like to turn there and follow along, and we will look at the whole chapter. Don't worry, it's only 14 verses long, but in Isaiah, <laughs> one verse is like, what, 
five or six lines long. So um, several lines long, only 14 verses. Um, that's all right. We'll get through it. So we're going to begin Isaiah 58, verse 1. Cry out loudly. Don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. They seek me day after day and delight to know my ways. Like a nation that does what is right and does not abandon the justice of their God. They ask me for righteous judgments. They delight in the nearness of God. Why have we fasted, but you have not seen? Why have we denied ourselves, but you haven't noticed? Look, you do as you please on the day of your fast and oppress all your workers. You fast with contention and strife to strike viciously with your fist. You cannot fast as you do today, hoping to make your voice heard on high. Will the fast I choose be like this? A day for a person to deny himself, to bow his head like a reed, and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Isn't this the fast I choose? To break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him, and not to ignore your own flesh and blood? Then your light will appear like the dawn, and your recovery will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you, and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. At that time when you call, the Lord will answer. When you cry out, he will say, Here I am. If you get rid of the yoke among you, the finger pointing and malicious speaking, and if you offer yourself to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted one, then your light will shine in the darkness and your night will be like noonday. The Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in a parched land and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden and a spring and like a spring whose water never runs dry. Some of you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will restore the foundations laid long ago. You will be called the repairer of broken walls, the restorer of streets where people live. If you keep from desecrating the Sabbath, from doing whatever you want on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, seeking your own pleasure, or talking business, then you will delight in the Lord and I will make you ride over the heights of the land and let you enjoy the heritage, the heritage of your father Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay. So we see the, in the first part of this chapter, we see what the people are doing. They are fasting, but they're fasting to try and get God's attention, to try and, and, and manipulate God to get his blessing. Uh, actually wrote down the, uh, the way the New Living Translation uh, translates verse 2 because it, it makes it much clearer um, how they are acting falsely in their, their fasting, how they are just fasting um, because they're thinking about themselves. Uh, it translates verse 2 this way. They act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. So it makes it really clear that their intent is not to actually honor God or grow close to him, but instead to try and make God bless them, to try and, and earn a blessing. And it, it reminds me of a, another memory verse we had from, from earlier in Matthew, um, from chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Um, I'm sure all of you still remember that. Um, it's only been a few chapters back. Um, but we see all, all through the, the first few verses there, that, that they are, are fasting. Verse 3, why have we fasted, but you have not seen? We have denied ourselves, but you haven't noticed. God, look at me. God, bless me. Look, I'm trying to serve you. And then we go to, to verse 6 and 7. 
And God says, isn't this the fast I choose to break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to share your bread with the hungry, to, to bring the poor and homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him and not to ignore your own flesh and blood? God said, you, you want me to notice? Then actually care for the people around you. Then actually show my love to, to the least of these. Which is what Craig's going to have in his passage out of Matthew today. Care for the least of these. That, that's how you show love for God. Not just by doing something to, to try and gain his attention. But by showing his love to everyone around you. And then uh, God says that he will, if you do these things, your light will shine in the darkness in verse 10. Your night will be like noonday. In verse 11, the Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in a parched land and strengthen your bones. God says, do that, and I'll take notice. You know, we're, we're all here in, in church right now, in church service on, on Sunday morning. But if that's all we ever do, thinking that's going to get God's attention and, and, and cause him to bless us, then we're mistaken if the rest of the week looks so much different than Sunday morning does. If we're not showing love for the least of these, the rest of the week. If we're not living for him, living to, to expand his kingdom and to make disciples, to show his love instead of just trying to, to do what we believe is our, our duty and obligation to make God take notice. So that's what I want our, our prayer focus to be this morning. I want you to pray about how are you showing love to the least of these? How are you showing God's love to others during the course of the week instead of just trying to, to gain his attention by doing what seems like your religious duty. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we come before you praising you and thanking you, first of all, God, that you are a God who cares for the least of these because, God, we are among the, the least of these. Uh, God, you, you have, have seen us and you have loved us and you have given us a way to know you and be near you. And, God, you desire for us to show your love to those who are, who are less fortunate, who are going without, who do not have. God, forgive us when we, when we think we are pleasing you, when we just focus on ourselves and don't pay any attention to those around us. God, help us to, to pay attention to the opportunities around us, to all those who are in need around us. Lord, and, and we, to our shame, get caught up in why and, and how people uh, get in the situations they're in. But God, you've commanded us to show your love. You've commanded us to, to give, to go, to do. God, help us to show your love. Help us to be a blessing to those so that we may be a blessing to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us as we continue with nothing but the glory.
next number is Song of the Month. In Jesus' name, God and Possible. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray that it's for you. I pray for your Praise team. <clears throat> the definition of a line of demarcation is a separation between things deemed to be distinct. It's often used as a, to define a border between nations, specifically usually nations that are hostile to one another. The most well-known would be the military demarcation line between North and South Korea. So it was established by the Korean Armistice Agreement of 1953. There's an extended area on either side called the Demilitarized Zone, or the DMZ for short. So on the south side of the DMZ, you would have South Korean and American soldiers patrolling the area, while on the north side, you have the North Korean soldiers on guard. 
But on April 27, 2018, President Moon Jae-in of South Korea crossed the border and stepped into North Korea to meet Chairman Kim Jong-un. And they announced that the border would be opened to allow locals and tourists to cross back and forth. Later in 2018, a railroad that connected the two countries was restarted and the militaries actually crossed into the other co- each other's countries to make a show of peace. Now, all of that window dressing aside, we know there's no peace between North and South Korea. We know there's no open border between those two countries and that there's always a threat of war looming over that line of demarcation. There's a distinct division there, and it will probably never be bridged in our lifetime. You know, as we close out our study of Matthew today, Jesus gives us a look at the ultimate line of demarcation, the line that separates those who are saved from those who are lost. And it is a line that will never be crossed in eternity. In this picture that Jesus gives us of the final judgment, we're reminded that our time is limited to reach those who are headed for eternal destruction, and it should give us a sense of urgency in our evangelism. It also gives us a means of self-examination to make sure that we are on the right side of that line. Now, salvation is a gift of God's grace. It's given to us through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But understand that our lives provide evidence of our identity as either belonging to the kingdom of God or belonging to the devil's kingdom that will receive eternal punishment. So I ask you today as we get started, what does the evidence in your life say about your eternal destiny? Not somebody else, but you. What does the evidence in your life say about your eternal destiny? If you don't like what you see today, turn to Christ before it's too late. Allow him to change you into a person who looks like him. And then take the rest of the time that you have left on this earth to reach those on the other side of that line of demarcation before it's too late for them to cross over and join us. Well, we're going to read Matthew 25 verses 31 through 46. You see our memory verse up there, if you would, say it with me. And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Amazed you did for me? Okay. I think there was an it in older translations. You did it. Maybe not. I don't know. It's confusing. All right. So we're going to start reading in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on the right, on his right, and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you didn't take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or without clothes, or sick, or in prison, and not help you? Then he will answer them, truly, 
Uh, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let us pray. Lord, as we look into your word, as we think about the final judgment, as we think about the division of the saved and the lost that will come one day, Lord, we are humbled, humbled to think that, uh, Lord, we will be judged one day, humbled to think that you would save us. And yet, Lord, as we read this passage, it, it should cause us to have a deep, sense of introspection. Lord, to see if our walk matches our talk. Lord, does our life give evidence of the salvation that we have received? Lord, if not, I pray that we would address that today. And then, Lord, I pray that we would, we would recognize the plight of those who are headed for eternal destruction and do not realize it. Lord, that we might take the gospel to them before it's too late to cross over into God's kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in this passage, we see uh, the line of demarcation between the saved and the unsaved is marked by the defining characteristics of love and mercy. So the line of demarcation between the saved and the unsaved is marked by the defining characteristics of love and mercy. So the first thing we see is the righteous will give evidence of salvation through acts of love and mercy toward others. <clears throat> so Jesus gives us a picture here of the separation of the sheep and the goats. Okay, It's not exactly a parable though because the rest of the story is just a straight picture of the final judgment. So he only uses the sheep and the goats as being representative of those who are saved and those who are lost. And the description he gives of his coming, he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him is a picture that we, he, he took directly from Daniel 7, 13, and 14, which says, I continue watching the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So what we see here is that Jesus at the final judgment will receive the kingdom from his Father and all the authority that goes with reigning over that kingdom. Now, probably the reason he chose sheep and goats to represent the two, uh, the two categories of people is because, well, they had a lot of sheep and goats. In ancient Israel, it would have been a perfectly clear picture for them because sheep and goats grazed together during the day. Sheep were far more valuable than goats, though. But from a distance, you often couldn't tell the difference between the sheep and the goats. At night, though, they had to be separated because the sheep, were they could stay warm because obviously they have thicker uh, wool, and uh, but the goats often had to be kept in an enclosed space where they could gain warmth better. So we get a picture here uh, that they would have understood. They would have recognized the distinct difference in value between sheep and goats. They would have understood that from a distance, you can't really tell the difference. But when you get close, it's not hard to tell which one is which. And then ultimately, they did have to be separated. So what we see here is that Jesus says the sheep would be placed at his right hand. And of course, the right hand would be the position of power and of honor. And then he places the goats on his left, which in this case would be a position of disgrace. And he he then goes on to address the ones on his right. He tells them to come and inherit the kingdom because they have been blessed by his father. Now certainly he means that they will inherit it with him and rule with him. We talked about that a little bit last week. Remember, we actually looked at a little glimpse from Revelation where it talked about how we will reign with him in heaven. But lest we think that because Jesus goes on to say what they've done for him in verses 35 and 36, that they somehow earned that blessing, what he says about them being blessed by the Father to inherit the kingdom reminds us that salvation is a gift that we receive from God. It is not something that we earn through anything that we do because guess what? You don't earn an inheritance. You can't earn an inheritance. You either have to be born or adopted into an inheritance. And we know that when we think about 
the kingdom of God just by what Jesus tells us in John 3, 3. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I don't know about you, but I don't think you can do that on your own. Being born again is something that has to be done to you, right? You can't produce it on your own. And then Romans 8 goes on to tell us about our adoption for all those led by God's spirit or God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies, himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs. So if we weren't children, we wouldn't be heirs. And we don't become children by anything that we do on our own. We become children because we are A, born again, and B, adopted into the family of God through Jesus Christ. Okay? But if we are now truly children of God, there will be defining characteristics or distinguishing marks that set us apart from those who are not God's children. I mean, we see that in our own children, right? We see the physical characteristics that they inherit from us. We also see the personality characteristics that they inherit from us. I think about my own daughter. You know, when she was little, everybody said she looked like me. Thank God she grew up to look like her mother. Amen? You know, but then I think it's just because she had no hair when she was little. She was a bald baby till she was about two. But you know what? When I look at her personality, I see a little bit of both of us, some good, some bad, right? And you know your own children. You know what you see in them that reminds you of yourself. You know, I saw, <laughs> saw Josh holding his little baby Grayson this morning. and I mean, that little boy looks just like him. I mean, spit an image of him, right? Well, guess what? God expects us as his children to look like him, right? There should be something about us that sets us apart from other people that when people look at us, they should be able to see, oh, he's one of God's children. Oh, she's one of God's children. So that's what he goes on to talk about. What are the defining characteristics that you see in the children of God? And he talks about things that are very practical. He says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you took care of me. I was in prison, you visited me. Jesus paints a picture of them showing love and mercy to him when he was in need. And I want to point out that it, obviously this list matters, right? These weren't randomly chosen. They're repeated four times in this passage. This list is repeated four times. Now, when the Bible has anything repeated, it means you probably ought to listen. So if you want to know if your life identifies with the kingdom of God, if you want to know whether your life looks like Jesus, look at this list. And see, am I producing that kind of fruit in my life? Am I showing love and mercy toward those in need, particularly as we will see in regard to those in the body of Christ, those who are part of God's family? I think it's very important that we recognize that this matters. It's not just what you say that I believe in Jesus. It's not just what you do by getting in a baptismal pool. It's about how you live your life out on a regular basis. Am I living like a child of God? Am I showing other people what my father looks like? But if this is the final judgment, I want you to think about this. And I mean, from everything we get here, this is final judgment. So that means at the very least, you'd have the people who were alive on the earth at that time gathered for judgment. More than likely, what we're talking about is a gathering of all the peoples that have ever lived on the earth, okay? How many of those actually lived at the same time as Jesus? Not many. Certainly not the ones that were alive at the time of his return, okay? So naturally, these people are stunned. They'll say, when did we ever do this for you, Jesus? I mean, they'd never laid eyes on him until the time of his return. So how in the world could they have possibly ministered to Jesus in the way that he says? Well, Jesus sums up the reason in verse 40, our memory verse. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
In other words, Jesus identifies with those people in need and particularly with his people in the church. And thus, anything that is done for them is done to him. You know, there's a whole lot of disagreement over who these brothers and sisters of mine are. All right? You want to find a commentary and read about it, you can. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time about it. But, you know, the question is, is Jesus talking about other believers? Since he often refers to his own followers as his brothers and sisters, like Matthew 12, 50, forever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Okay? So followers of Christ are his brothers and sisters, so certainly they would be included here. Or is Jesus talking about the poor and needy in general? Because he testifies that he identifies with them in their suffering. Luke 4, 17 through 21, his first public message that we have recorded, which is really just him reading out of the scroll of Isaiah. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to do what? To preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, today as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. That's a really short sermon, but it really gets to the point of what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to minister to those who are in need, and he identifies with those who suffer. So we could say the brothers and sisters of mine might just be the church, or it could apply to all those who live that are suffering out in our world today. It could be referring to believers who take the gospel into dangerous places. Matthew 10, 40 through 42 seems to imply that. The one who welcomes you welcomes me. The one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. All right? So that means that a person who takes the gospel out is a representative of Jesus, and Jesus represents his Father. He says, anyone who welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who welcomes a righteous person because he's righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. So I think we could cast a pretty broad net here over what Jesus is saying. Because I believe Jesus expects us not to just simply love those who are like us or simply love those who believe the same way as us. I mean, Matthew 5, 43 through 45 seems to say you got to love everybody. You've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So we have a picture here of a big tent of God's love that we're supposed to spread around right? We're supposed to love other people and show love to them. And Jesus said, that's how the world would know we were his disciples. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we've got to start by loving each other. We certainly can't love the people out in the world who need his love if we can't love the people that we're already part of the family with. Amen. All right? So it's got to start here, and then it's got to spread out from there. Love is the very fulfillment of the divine law that God has given us. Remember what Jesus said, the two greatest commandments were to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we can't love our neighbor if we don't love God. But what we do know is that if we don't love our neighbor, it shows that we don't love God. The two are connected and cannot be separated. The early church father Augustine gives a description of love that I think is really wonderful. He said this, What does it look like? It has hands to help others, feet to hasten to the poor and needy, eyes to see misery and want, ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. What a beautiful picture. I wonder, is this kind of love and mercy evident in your life? Is it evident in mine? Can other people see the evidence of our relationship to our Heavenly Father? Do you ever truly consider that how you treat others is indicative of how you treat Jesus? You ever thought about that? How I treat someone else 
is indicative of how I would treat Jesus if he were right in front of me at this moment. You know, if we truly considered that all the time, I bet we'd treat people a little different. Don't you? Well, second, we see the line of demarcation between the saved and the unsaved and how the condemned will give evidence of being lost by having failed to show love and mercy. All right? So we've already seen that the righteous have proven that they are righteous because they've shown love and mercy toward others the way that they had received love and mercy from Christ. But the condemned give evidence of being lost because they don't show any love and mercy. So Jesus now turns to those on his left and he sentences them to eternal punishment. Now it's interesting, notice that the eternal fire of hell that he speaks of in verse 41 says it was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now if you go back up to verse 34, he says that those who are blessed by his father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Right? So the kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, was prepared as a reward initially when God created everything. But hell was only created when the devil and his angels fell. And it was always intended for them. It was never intended for us. But here's an important point. The angels had no opportunity to repent that fell. The devil never had an opportunity to repent. The angels never had an opportunity to repent. Once they made their choice, their fate was sealed. But I want you to understand something today. People have a choice. People have a choice when it comes to their fate. They choose how they want to live their lives, and they have an opportunity to repent and turn back to God when confronted with the truth. So now, as Jesus' description of the reason for their punishment makes clear, they could have changed their behavior. Look at what he says. He says there in verse 42, For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't take care of me. In other words, there were opportunities that were presented to them on a regular basis for them to change their ways, for them to turn and follow him. But they chose not to. They could have fed the hungry. They could have given water to the thirsty. They could have helped the stranger. They could have given clothes to the naked. They could have taken care of those who were sick and in prison. But they chose not to. You know, ultimately, we know that God is the one who makes final judgment. God is the one who assigns people to heaven, and he assigns people to hell. And we know that only, the only way people go to heaven is if God graciously saves them, chooses them before the foundation of the world, as the Bible tells us. But understand that people who are assigned to hell go there because of their own free will, Amen. because they choose to go that way. They choose to rebel against God and everything that is good. So what is the reason that anyone would ever choose that path? What is the reason for the inactivity of these folks? Or even worse, their callous indifference to the plight of the suffering. It would be because they lack the love of God. There's a lack of the love of God in their hearts. 1 John 3, 7 through 10 explains that. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And understand when it says commits sin, it is a verb tense that indicates ongoing habitual activity. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin. Because his seed remains in him. And remember, that means does not practice sin habitually. He's not even able to do that. He's not able to sin because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God. And what is it that signifies that? The one who does not love his brother or sister. That's a big mouthful to say the one way that you can tell someone doesn't know God and is a child of the devil is that they have no love for other people. No love for other people. You know, that's real easy when we're looking at world history to say somebody like Nero 
or Hitler or Stalin or come up with any crazy dictator of the last 2,000 years. It's real easy to fit people into that category. We have a much harder time recognizing it when it's closer to home. Because it's not just the big sins of, you know, mass genocide that constitute a person that does not love his brother or sister. Jesus says it's as simple as a person that isn't willing to give a cup of water to a thirsty person. It's someone who is so self-centered that they cannot see the needs right in front of them and make an effort to help them. Now, of course, there's no recollection of these people on their parts of when they've ever denied Jesus any of these things, right? Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty or stranger, without clothes, sick in prison? When did we not help you? And I'm sure they were being, you know, very pious when they said these things. We, we, we never saw anything like this. But, you know, their denial is curiously like the opposite, the corollary over Matthew 7, where it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. What did we say the will of the Father in heaven was? To love your brother and sister, right? On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? I mean, we did some great religious stuff for you, Jesus. Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Interesting. In other words, you can look really religious on the outside and have no love in your heart on the inside and be condemned by God. Amen. Simple as that. You know, I think about we just finished up looking at the woes that Jesus pronounced on the Pharisees, the religious leaders. I mean, there could not have been anybody in the whole world that was better, that looked better on the surface than the Pharisees. What did he say? He said, you know, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're real pretty on the outside, but you're all dead on the inside, right? They, they knew how to go through the motions. They knew how to do all the prescribed rituals. They knew how to make themselves look good to people, but the problem was there was no actual love in their hearts for God or anyone else. It was all just a show. It was all just a show, and that's why Jesus condemned them. The result, you see, here's the catch. The result will be the same for those who commit those terrible, awful sins like Hitler as it will be for those who seem to be relatively good but don't have a real relationship with the Lord. That's hard for us to justify in our minds, isn't it? How many people have you said about someone or you've heard someone say, well, my neighbor, you know, that he doesn't go to church and I don't think he knows the Lord, but he's a good person. How many times have you said that, heard that? How many of those good people from our perspective will be in heaven? None of them apart from the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's what I want us to understand today. You see, this brings up an important point that we don't want to miss. When we think of sin, we think of really bad things, the big, you know, the big ones like murder and adultery, stealing, things like that. So if we don't do those things, certainly we'll go to heaven when we die. But Jesus makes the point here that sins of omission are equally as serious, if not more so, than sins of commission. You know, when I was little, my dad used to pray, and my dad could pray really long, big words. But the one I remember the most that he'd prayed, Lord, forgive us of our sins of commission and omission. And I was a little kid. I had no idea what that meant. I always wondered, what in the world is my dad talking about? Well, I want to explain it to you today. It's real simple. Sins of commission are things that you commit, things you do. Sins of omission are things that you should do that you don't, right? Things that you should do, but you don't. James 4, 17, some sins of omission up really well. It is sin to know the good and yet not do it. There you go. 
That's your definition of a sin of omission. If you know what is good and you don't do it, that's sin. Now, I want you to think how many sins of omission you commit on a regular basis when you know the good and don't do it. Now, it's great that you're not out killing people. I'm thankful that none of these people in here today are murderers. I'm thankful that you didn't sleep around on your spouse last night. I'm thankful that you're not going to steal something out of my car. There's nothing worth anything in there. I'm thankful that I don't have to worry about that. But we still are a bunch of sinners because of that verse. We know the good a lot of times, but we don't necessarily do it. And we can dismiss sins of omission so easily without even considering it and we miss where there's a big separation in our relationship with the Lord. In his book, Knowing Sin, Mark Jones says this, we err by focusing too much on actual sins and neglecting the fact that sin, always against God, involves not just actions, but also inclinations and desires that may or may not lead to an act. Sins of omission concern those affirming what each commandment requires. So the commandment to not kill demands the preservation of life. I'll never forget having a class at seminary where the professor talked about the Ten Commandments from a positive perspective and what they implied that we should do, not just what we should not do. And I remember that was, that was earth-shattering for me. I'd never really thought about that. But, you know, we could think about that today as a case study. What's a big hot topic in our country right now? Abortion. We know abortion is a direct violation of the command not to kill, don't we? We all, we, I, I would hope we can all agree with that. That is a sin of commission. But to do nothing to try to stop abortion, to do nothing to try to help people that are involved in that practice, that's also sin. And I dare say most of us are guilty of that sin. By ignoring the problem, we all become party to the sin of omission. It's just not enough to do nothing. That's why I want to remind you, Jesus didn't put us here to sit and soak and wait for him to come back. He put us here to serve and make a difference as salt and light in our world, Amen. particularly here in this place where he's put us. You know, while he was on earth, Jesus not only avoided outright sin, he made a practice of actively doing good by seeking to preserve, to bless, and improve the lives of those he encountered. I want you to think about how he went out of the way to heal 10 lepers. He went out of his way to heal those 10 lepers. He said, I need to go through Samaria so he could have a conversation with a Samaritan woman that was forbidden by the codes of that day so that she could come to saving faith in him. Think about all the different times that Jesus went out of his way to do good and show love to others. Why did he do that? Because he had an unbounded love for others that was willing to sacrifice himself in order to be a blessing to them. And I think that characteristic is seen most clearly in what Jesus did for us on the cross. Romans 5, 6 through 10, for while we were still helpless... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? Think about that. Christ died for you while you were helpless, ungodly, his, a sinner, and his enemy. He could have left us to die in our sins and no one would have blamed him, but from the perspective of God's love, that would have been a sin of omission. Amen. It would have been a sin of omission because he would have known the good and not done it. He went out of his way to save your soul, to show love for you that can only be described as divine. 
And so the righteous one died for us, the unrighteous. The strong gave himself for the weak so that we might be made righteous and strong. And what he has done not only gives us salvation, but it offers us an example of how we are supposed to live in this world because we are to follow his example. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, the love of Christ compels us. What love? The love that he showed by dying on the cross for us. Since we have reached this conclusion that one died for all and therefore all died, and he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Interesting. The love of Christ compels us not to live for ourselves, but to live for him. And how do we show that we're living for him? By ministering to those he identifies with. There you go. If you ever wanted to understand how you can know that you're saved, that's it. Am I truly living for the one who died for me by ministering to those that he has put in front of me? As though it were him. As though it were him. You know, think about it. If those people had known that it was Jesus in front of them, I think they would have acted differently. I think it would have changed how they lived and treated others. 1 John 4, 19 through 21 is a really interesting passage. It says we love because he first loved us. We, we, we can't love anybody apart from his love being in us. So any other love that you see out in this world is not true love. It's not the love that comes from God. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. You know, a saving encounter with Jesus changes everything. It changes our perspective on how we look at other people and how we treat them. But if nothing has changed, then we can't be sure that Jesus is present in our lives at all. There was a man who took his little eight-year-old daughter on a tour of London, and they went into Westminster Abbey. The little girl was awestruck. She stared up at the huge columns, and she, she was studying the beauty and the grandeur of that massive Gothic piece of architecture. Her father was impressed by her concentration, and so he asked her, he said, he said, what are you thinking, honey? She looked up at him, and she said, Daddy, I was just thinking about how big you seem at home and how small you seem here. I think when we get a proper view of the love of God and the grace that Jesus has shown to us, it should give us a better perspective on our own sin. In light of his perfection, we certainly see our own imperfections a lot more, don't we? It shows up. You see, when I compare myself with you all, well, I look okay. When I compare myself with people outside the church, I look really good because my sin seems very small and theirs seems to be so big. But when I look into the light of Jesus and I see the cross there before me and I recognize that it was my sin that put him there, then it puts me in my place and helps me to remember that I am nothing more than a sinner who is saved by grace and I have the opportunity to transmit that grace to other people. So folks, I want to ask you a couple questions as we close today. What evidence of salvation do you see in your life? What evidence of salvation do you see in your life? What, what has changed as a result of your meeting Jesus? Are there acts of love and mercy that point to a change of heart? Or is there clear and compelling evidence of a self-centered life. I'm going to tell you what, it's better that we judge ourselves now than that, we, than that we wait till the end when he will judge us with a perfect judgment. We don't want that to happen. And when he comes back to judge, it'll be too late to repent. But today is your opportunity to let him save you and change you.
And I invite you to do that today by confessing your sins to him. Come down during the time of invitation when we sing the hymn and pray with me and, and ask God to forgive you of your sin and turn away from your sin and turn to him for salvation, to ask him for a transformation of your heart that will not only impact your life in eternity, but that will change the way you live your life today. I pray that you will do that. But if you're a believer and you're sitting here listening today, I want to ask you, does your life match your profession of faith? Does your walk match your talk? It's so easy to talk about what we believe in and what we stand up for and what we think is right and wrong, but do we actually live lives that look like Jesus? Folks, I think we've all got a lot of work to shore up in that area, and I think we need a lot of help from him and one another. And so I invite you and myself to take this time to repent of our own failure to live like Jesus and to ask him to help us to begin to love others the way that he has loved us. And get this, the more evidence we see in our lives of salvation, acts of love and mercy toward others that are based in nothing more than a sacrificial uh, life because of what Christ has done for us. When we begin to see those things in our lives, guess what it'll give us? It'll give us greater assurance of our salvation that is yet to come. You know, I talk to so many people who lack assurance, and they lack assurance because they're not living the Christian life. When you're walking close to Jesus and you're living for him, it'll give you greater confidence about where you're going when you die. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you have made provision for us unworthy sinners, that you loved us while we were your, your enemies, while we were sinners, ungodly, weak, and helpless. And we thank you that somehow you take these wretched wretched lives, and you make something glorious out of them. We thank you that somehow you can work through us to make a difference in our world when it seems like we have nothing to offer. But Lord, we come before you this morning to confess that we fall far short of the ideal that you have set for us, the goal that you have placed before us. And so we plead with you for mercy for grace, for strength, for endurance, perseverance. Lord, help us to turn away from our selfishness so that we can truly love others the way you've loved us. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today who doesn't have assurance of salvation, Lord, that is sitting here today and can honestly testify that they don't see the evidence of your presence in their lives, I pray that today they would fall at the foot of the cross that they would cast their sin upon you. And Lord, that you might forgive them and give them freedom, change their lives, not only now, but for eternity. So Lord, I just pray, as your word says, you would draw people to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us.
appropriate ending line there. Amen. This afternoon, we've got a couple of activities going on. Youth will be meeting at 5 o'clock in the basement, and Team Kid will meet at 530 in the Family Life Center. I uh, want to remind you, if you're on the nominating committee, y'all are going to be meeting at 715. Eric, are they going to meet in here? All right, be meeting in the men's Sunday school room, behind there in the right. Uh, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, Helping Hands group meet in the social room, Family Life Center. This Wednesday's church supper at 6 o'clock. I hear we're having something really good, too. Chicken tetrazzini. Sounds fancy. I'm looking forward to it. Sign up before you go today. And pies. That's even better than chicken tetrazzini. All right. All right. So that's at 6 o'clock Wednesday. Sign up on the sheets in the hallway or talk to Lynn before you leave, which Lynn, Lynn's gone. Oh, there she is. You're so small, Lynn. I missed you over there. Uh, but let, let her know by Wednesday. Uh, be great to know today, I think. It's, today is the deadline, all right? So don't let her know between now and Wednesday. Let her know today. All right. And then, all right, after the church supper, uh, at 645, Vacation Bible School workers are going to meet in the Family Life Center social room for a brief meeting. Uh, Cindy wants to touch base with all her workers as we get ready for Vacation Bible School coming up at the end of July. Uh, at 7 o'clock, our business meeting will be in here, quarterly business meeting. And then at 8 o'clock, deacons will meet in the men's Sunday school class following the business meeting. Saturday morning at 8 o'clock is our men's ministry breakfast. I hope, guys, you'll come out and join us for that, eat some good breakfast. We'll do some Bible study. Next Sunday, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, so I pray that you will be preparing your hearts between now and then for that. God is good. All the time. All the time. Have a blessed day.